Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor to invite Professor Lufili Grimo to give a lecture at Southwest Yalu University. Professor Lufili got his PhD degree from Long, Long University and is a member of his Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton University. Now, she is the professor at Loma University. She is now the director of ICI Net, the founding member of European Physical Society and a member of the board of ENEA and member Italian Physical Society. And Professor Rufidi is also the founding member of European Physical Society. Today, she's uh, Lecture title is Black Hole Gravitational Waves and Binary Driven Hyperloma. Let's welcome Professor Dufini. Uh, it is uh, difficult to uh, find uh, a topic to bring you, I uh, will try to bring you from the history of the past to the frontier that we are living in these days in our understanding of the universe. And uh, I start from very far back. Many of the development of the knowledge of the universe were done in parallel between Europe and China. And uh, this is uh, an historical, uh, and uh, I would like also to explain how the vision of the universe has changed in time. During the Greek time, the universe was represented at the time of Ptolemy, very uh, constructed around the earth and that time was the time in which uh, the Mediterranean was the center and then around they were all the, uh, the, the sun, the planets and far away the fixed star. This was uh, the European, Italian, Greek point of view. It's very interesting that at that time, China had a very more interesting point of view of the universe. It was not structured so, at, uh, so strongly. It was uh, very much uh, free in a certain sense. And uh, this uh, map of the universe of Mont Xing of the 700 shows the difference, a difference between a, a description of the universe in the Chinese culture of the time. But again, at the center of the universe in this case was China, not the Mediterranean. It took, of course, a long progress to move not to have the earth at the center of the universe, but move the center of the universe with Copernicus to the, to the sun. And uh, you remember how difficult it was to move from the earth to the sun description and the universe was localized around the sun in the planetary system. But then, a very, maybe the greatest revolution happened with uh, Galileo. Because <clears throat> Galileo invented the telescope and looked and start not astronomy, but astrophysics. Namely, 
de Galileo introduce through the telescope to apply in what he was seeing the law of physics from the earth. And he made a postulate that the law of physics should be valid in all the universe. The law of physics. And this time was a, a, a special time which we celebrate even here because at the time of Galileo there was Rimato, Matteo Ricci, in Beijing. And uh, Rimato had uh, a student, Xuquanchi, and we are celebrating the friendship between Italy and China in this meeting today in the spirit of collaboration between Galileo through Rimato with Xu Quanchi. The referral meeting is the Galileo Xu Quanchi. And it's very interesting that exactly in those years after the time, seven years after Galileo invented the telescope, seven years after, already a telescope was brought from Italy to Beijing. And this is the image of this telescope. The reform, of course, uh, uh, the telescope was used to look at the boat and the army on the earth, but Galileo point the telescope to the sky. And he, he, he noticed that the Jupiter and the planets were moving. And he started to analyze the picture, the images, the images of the of the moon. And the big step of Galileo was to assume that the law of physics apply on the earth, contrary to uh, Aristotle and all the philosophers, that they thought physics only apply to the earth. But Galileo, looking in the telescope, postulated that the law of physics were invariant with respect to space and time translation, the Galilean transformation, invariant by space and time transformation. And this allowed him from the, from the shadow he observed in the telescope, this is our, the drawing of Galileo, <laughs> to find that in the, on, the, on the moon there were big mountains. And has been very beautiful that when the Americans went to the moon, could verify the height of the mountains of the moon, very similar to the one that Galileo predicted. This was, was the, the early beginning. But Galileo also looked in the sky how you call the, the, the Via Lattea in, uh, in eh? the, 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 the Milky Way. And looking with the telescope in the Milky Way, people did not know what the Milky Way was. Uh, they had no idea. He said that looking with the telescope, Galaxia nil est halyut qua quancunque in regione. This is in Latin. In whatever place he was looking in the galaxy, he was, he was finding many stars, like the sun. Therefore, this is a moment incredible that man, for the first time, Galileo, pointing to the galaxy understand that it's not the Earth at the center 
of the universe is not to the sun, like Copernicus at the center of the universe. He understands physics, is, astrophysics is born, and he understands that there are many, many stars like our sun. This is the beginning of taking power of uh, our knowledge of the universe. Of course, today we are interested in uh, relativistic astrophysics. And from Galileo, there have been many centuries, but then Albert Einstein introduced general relativity. The Einstein theory is uh, very different from the Newtonian theory of Newton. We were discussing still today and uh, in these days all the intricacy and difficulty of uh, understanding general relativistic effect. But for general relativity to be important, you need a very strong gravitational field. Therefore, an object should be very dense and very massive. Not only dense, but massive. Big mass. And uh, the monument, the monument, of this uh, of the object more massive was discovered by the Chinese in 1054. In 1054, Europe were in the European were not interested to look uh, at the sky because they thought the sky was not changing, but exactly. The philosophy of that man, which I showed in the beginning, Chinese were ready to look at the star and take note of all the objects every day in the, sky, in the sky. And they noticed in 1054, with the Chinese and the Korean and Japanese, the, the uh, that there was a star which had uh, appeared in the sky, what they call a guest star. Today, is the pic this one is the picture of, the, of that guest star taken by the space telescope. <coughs> this is the, the object which has been expanding since 1054 and is still expanding today with emitting a great quantity of light a great quantity of light and still expanding and the big issue is what is the origin of this explosion and why it is so important for general relativity. Many studies have been done, Oppenheimer, Bell, uh, uh, all the way, and still today this is a picture just taken by the Space Telescope. But uh, in this star, in the center of that crab nebula, maybe we should give uh, some light to show, I don't know if you can see well, but anyway, in the center of the Crab Nebula, it was discovered in 1968 that there were two stars. One star was stable. The other star was turning on and off, on and off, on and off. And the period, you see this picture, you have one star, then two star, then two star, then one star, then one star again. The difference between this and this and this 
is one millisecond. One millisecond. Therefore, this star was turning on the one, two, 11, 11, 33, 33. Every 33 milliseconds, this star was turning on and off, on and off, on and off. It was clear that this was an object which Oppenheimer and other scientists had in, imagined was a neutron star at the center of the Crab Nebula. And this neutron star has a dimension of the order of 10 kilometers, a mass big like the sun, a density like nuclear density. If you take a millimeter cube, you have a big mountain uh, <laughs> compressed at that density. This was the starting point for, in 1968, for the birth of a new field, the application of Einstein theory to the universe. In these days, I was in Princeton, I was working in Princeton, and uh, we studied first the neutron star, and then the black hole. And uh, just after that period, I want to show you my, I think my, my first visit. Oh, you cannot see. <coughs> my first visit uh, to uh, China in 1978. And uh, I don't know if you can see that. No, too low was the line. Well, this was my first vid visit in Beijing University. Uh, at the, at the, yes, uh, Beida. And. Uh, and it's very interesting that the last year I've shown this picture again at Beida, and there was uh, a professor who introduced me who could recognize himself in, uh, in this picture. These were the, the professors at, uh, at Beida. This was 1978. All the library were burned practically by the Cultural Revolution. And it's incredible for me today to visit a new China with so many young students and such enormous difference and uh, in, in impressive, uh, uh, so impressive. This was the time in which, oh, cannot see very well, I uh, publish this uh, book on relativistic astrophysics that maybe you can find still uh, in, uh, in the library. <laughs> this was uh, written with uh, Professor Frank Ligi. Well, so much for the history. Now let's go to but I don't know if you, if you can see well to last week and to what we are, is happening. Oh no, you cannot see. Maybe just take a wish. Uh, this is just last week. I don't know how many of you know the people in this picture, well, see very close. I am here. No, here's Volker, here I am. The other person is Stephen Hawking. How many of you know Stephen Hawking? 
mathematical formula indicating these problems. And the first time that the black hole was all beautiful, much better. Well, I show also. No, this one is definitely this one is a little better. This one is my hope. Again, so and so. This one is uh, ah, myself, Volker, uh, and Stephen Hawking in the. Stephen uh, is, cannot speak. Uh, he has uh, uh, a machine. And uh, it was very nice to, that we were, well, nobody goes at his own usually, but we are very good friends, the referee invited me, and we had dinner at his home. 
But everything was special. For example, I look at this house and said, uh, I told him, beautiful house. And then he answered, yes, I built it myself. <laughs> and uh, the beauty of Stephen is that no matter the difficulty, he's always smiling. <laughs> and uh, he, in his eyes, there is uh, great joy. But uh, this formula, this uh, atmosphere of the black hole, we started with, uh, we first introduced the first black hole with uh, uh, John Wheeler. And this was this famous formula, which I think many of you, or some of you, will study one day. And the key part of this formula is this irreducible mass. There is a part in the black hole which cannot go away. And then there is rotation, uh, rotational energy, Coulomb energy. We had a talk today, in the last talk, the previous to the last, just showing how to take away the rotational energy in the center of the galaxy after the meeting. Therefore, this formula is really fundamental for astrophysics. And, um, and uh, the first time that the black hole was found has been in a companion between a star and uh, a black hole in a Bible in, in 1973. Well, for these were still past but I would like to try to reach the situation, the situation today. Uh, the big difference from the old time of Galileo and to the first uh, X-ray satellite has been uh, the enormous effort of building new satellite looking in the X-ray, in the gamma rays, in the high energy. And uh, one uh, of these satellites, uh, the, this set of satellites, the Vila satellite, had been introduced to make sure that uh, no atomic bomb would explode on the Earth. Because it's a non-proliferation agreement. Therefore, the United States put in orbit some satellites to make sure that the non-proliferation agreement of the bomb will be enforced. And after the satellites were on, uh, they discovered some uh, some. Uh, signal in some of the satellites which were like atomic bomb explosion. But they were not coming from the Earth. They were not coming from the planetary system because otherwise they would be coming from the ecliptic. They were not coming from the galaxy because otherwise they would have the signature of the galaxy. They were homogeneously distributed in, the, in all directions. And finally, to a beautiful story, which uh, I will uh, write a book soon, that way you can read and possibly also will be translated in Chinese. There has been a small satellite from Italy that has been able to catch this explosion in the moment of explosion and give the good position in the sky. And then that position was transmitted to the Earth and from the, uh, uh, to, the, to the Earth surface, not looking uh, from the satellite, but to, to looking from the optical telescope from the Earth. And it was possible, and the uh, uh, other uh, radio telescope, it was possible to find the, the light coming from this uh, source. And uh, as the astronomer know, if you have light 
coming from a, a source far away from us, the universe is expanding. Therefore, if the source is very far, the wavelength will be Doppler shift longer. Therefore, if you compare a, a, a line on the Earth coming from a far away object, and you compare the wavelength to the same wavelength of the same element, the one coming from far away and expanding with the universe, with the one here, it will be longer. And the longer wavelength, the longer, the larger the distance, the Hubble law implies, the more shifted it is. And from that, it be became clear that this object were 10 billion light years away from us. The farthest object in the universe, which they look like a bomb exploding on the Earth, but being so far, their energy is of the order of 10 to the 54 Earth. If you take the luminosity of the sun, it's 10 to the 33 Earth. If you take all the stars of the galaxy, it's 10 to the 12, 10, 10 to the 33, it's 10 to the 45, 10 to the 54, you are still a billion more. And that is the light of all the galaxies, of all the stars, of all the galaxies in the universe, in that gamma ray burst. Well, I will, uh, I would like to give you just uh, some uh, short highlights about uh, about uh, these uh, objects which we are studying, and uh, we are discovering that the systems are much more interesting than a supernova like the one in the Crab Nebula, or even a black hole in Cygnus Sexual. What we are really witnessing is all a family of events which start from binary, two, bi two, two, neutral, two massive stars. And uh, the more massive star evolved first, and uh, here, uh, is represented to create a supernova or a black hole. And the other star, uh, if you have a massive star, the, this is a very important concept. The bigger is the mass of the star, the quicker it is evolved. The, its life is short. The bigger is the mass. It evolves very much faster. Therefore, if you have a 60 solar mass star, a 30 mass solar mass star, the 60 solar mass star evolve first and end its life either in a supernova or a black hole. Then the less massive star, the 130, evolves itself and later on ends its life in presence of the neutron star, first neutron star. And uh, in the explosion, you can have, of the supernova, you can have attrition on the neutron star. And if, mat if uh, is enough matter transfer from the supernova into the neutron star, you can form a black hole. Therefore, this is the sequence that we are seeing now with the all this uh, telescope. And uh, from this system can create new, two neutron stars going around each other, or a black hole and the neutron star. In other words, uh, it's uh, an evolving uh, system uh, which we can follow for the first time in great detail. OK, I will just show you a few uh, example of the most recent work of the last uh, of these uh, few last months. This is the case precisely of uh, the supernova 
which explore and as, as a companion in a binary, a neutron star. This is uh, a computation which we have done. And uh, uh, you see 3.82 seconds is three seconds after the explosion of the star. Three, eight, two seconds. You see up there. Then you have the, the, the star exploding and the neutron star going around. After uh, uh, seven seconds, the supernova has ex expanded and the neutron star is inside the supernova. And uh, in that period, one solar mass of star of mass is transferred from the supernova inside the neutron star. 382 seconds. Se 382 seconds the beginning. 77 seconds the evolution. And then after 254 seconds, we are speaking about a very short time, 254 seconds, you see that this, new, this neutron star collapsed to a black hole. <coughs> and after 354 seconds, uh, you have that the black hole emits a gamma ray burst. Now, you can imagine that this phenomenon is completely new in astrophysics. We are speaking about a process altogether which lasts six minutes. Six minutes. You understand? But this six minutes phenomenon happens at 10 billion light years away. Therefore, our technology has been able to receive the signal from 10 billion light years away when the universe was very young and reaching us and we are able to decipher the message thanks to the Einstein equation. You understand? This is uh, incredible because usually people, astronomers, were looking at an object in the sky, always the same, like the Crab Nebula expanding, but the Sun, the objects which were there no matter evolving, but uh, no matter what, but uh, in the, what happens, went away, always, no, it's uh, another paper which we have just published, and uh, what we are seeing, this is a space-time data, it's a little complicated, but we have a little star here, a supernova, the accretion of the supernova, uh, the formation of the black hole, this is a space-time diagram in uh, following Einstein theory, then a gamma reverse from that way, and uh, another signal goes on the other way, and uh, what we you have, we, we see this conceptual uh, evolution in real time in the satellites, and we can decipher the formation of the black hole. Then there is uh, still another very technical moment. When you have a rotating black hole, the rotating black hole emits energy. And therefore, at the moment of formation of the black hole, we see an emission of very high energy in the gel. And we can see still there in binary neutron star. And, uh, but right now, what we are really witnessing, 
It's a very complicated and beautiful situation that we can follow this binary system, supernova neutron star evolving and forming another neutron star, and then two neutron stars starting over and forming a black hole, and so and so evolving. In other words, uh, uh, traditionally, uh, physics and uh, uh, physics uh, and astronomy were usually looking at experiments in real time on a single object. Instead, instead, in the case, instead, in this case, of course, we cannot follow a single object evolution because there are <coughs> billions of light years away. But we can look all over the universe and find many billion objects and then we can classify this object in different families. And then what happens is we cannot do an experiment on a single object, but we can follow the evolution on different phases of different objects in the universe. And it is precisely equivalent to make an experiment on the Earth. In other words, in, when you do a collision of particle on the Earth, you see a physics experiment, and you do the condition to do the experiment. But in astrophysics, you cannot do an experiment, because you have enormous mass, enormous energy. But you, since you don't have there are so many satellites and we are looking all over the universe. You can always find in the universe different objects which are the evolution of, the, of uh, a, a given initial condition. And therefore looking in the universe you can find an evolution and an experiment precisely like the physics experiment on the Earth. Therefore thanks to um, the means that we have, the satellites, uh, the observatory on the Earth, we can indeed develop a science, the science of relativistic astrophysics, which is uh, equivalent to the one of Galileo presented at, uh, uh, in, uh, in the beginning of the Renaissance. The idea of Galileo don't follow philosophy, <laughs> don't follow uh, abstract theory, but do an experiment. And if the experiment gives a result, that is true. And don't get involved in other things. You can do whatever theory you want, but Galileo said then do the experiment and check. Relativistic astrophysics is today possible. Namely, we can look all over the universe find objects all over the universe, classify them, and then do an experiment and verify if the theory is correct. This is uh, one of the latest images that uh, uh, some of our group has been making, and uh, it's the most recent. We just brought uh, out of the computer uh, a few days ago, which shows a particle that going inside a care solution, a black hole in a gamma ray burst. Now, some of you maybe ask, but what is good this gamma ray burst? Why they are so important? Well, they are important because you want to understand them. 
we want to understand how the universe works. We want to apply the Einstein equation and be guided to their knowledge. This is already very important. But I would like to make you think about another point, which to me is very important. I did this with uh, a Chinese collaborator, Peace in Chen. The problem is, well, it's not as usual. Well, it, it, it's nice anyway, the picture, uh, as it is uh, the form. But we are sitting here, you are listening, I am speaking, and life, life is based on the DNA, the helix. Now, radiation, the radiation which comes out of the gamma ray burst or the neutron star, is the one which created the cosmic rays and the high energy, which comes on the planet Earth and comes all over the universe. And that radiation is the one which can create the change of the DNA, break the DNA. This is the gamma ray coming in and the helix of DNA which can be cut by radiation. And when the DNA recombines, you have mutation. A new species come out. Therefore, if we are sitting here, Homo sapiens, Homo sapiens, our DNA was mutated thanks also to the gamma ray burst and to the neutron star. The gamma ray which bombarded the planets has created the mutation. And the fact that this uh, uh, radiation happens even 10 billion years before now, at very large distance, if nature does not, is, uh, I think nature does not waste energy, therefore this implies, in my opinion, that there is life all over the universe which use this gamma ray burst to create the mutation of the DNA. This is uh, my message to you to make uh, you live a little bit the ex an experience which we are living every day of exploring the magnitude and the splendid aspect of our universe. We are few people who had uh, this adventure, but now I think even today maybe some of you will have a sparkle and keep going. Okay. <laughs> if there are questions, although we are no uh, very beautiful images, but, uh, 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 but uh, I will be happy to answer. I will continue when you can. Please. Uh, ciao. <laughs> nice to meet you. And it's the only word, Italian word I know. And ciao. Here, yeah, ciao. <laughs> and here I'm a freshman who majored in applied physics. And I want to ask you three questions. The first one is that what prompts you to study in physics? In another word, why do you choose to study physics? Interest or other demands? Well, I have to tell you the truth. It's because I found the simplest thing I would like to do. <laughs> because, because I was very interested in uh, economics. And, uh, but then I realized that was uh, no fundamental. 
and I was interested in something in which I could give my own personal contribution. Then I was interested in medicine, but medicine is too complicated, even today I had this experience here. Medicine is too complicated because I should study. I would like to do something on which I can tell my opinion. For medicine, I should know chemistry or uh, biology, but medicine is not. Then I went to chemistry, but was not methodologically clean. Then I try, <laughs> then I try uh, to go to mathematics, and that was very good, but was no, no, uh, no clear what the object was in reality. But was fantastic, and I studied strongly mathematics. But then I found physics, and physics, again, uh, was correct because of creativity, like uh, Galileo used to do. And then, in the physics, there were many p nuclear physics, particle physics, all this, and then I chose the simplest possible physics in physics that is general relativity, only space and time, nothing else. So it seems that physics is the most suitable job for you, yeah? For me, yes, yeah. it was the simplest. So when did you start uh, studying physics? When did you start? Uh, I studied uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Rome, where there was uh, a, a great school of physics in 19... Uh, uh, 67, 66, 67, and uh, and uh, in in that school, Enrico Fermi had been re doing research and discovered the structure of the nucleus, and uh, therefore there was a big tradition. And Enrico Fermi had been later, after he left Rome and went to Chicago, the teacher of T.D. Lee and C.M. Young. And here comes the second one. The second one is that, do you believe that we can take time travel by so-called wormhole, no. which was proposed by Albert Einstein? No, it was not proposed by Albert Einstein. This was proposed by by some filmmaker later on. Yeah. But Einstein, Einstein, Einstein never uh, uh, did the warm holes. No, he, he, yeah, I know that is uh, someone else, but it, the theory, the theory, and uh, the warm hole theory is uh, accomplished by Albert and other one. No, uh, uh, Einstein rose and studied a bridge. But if, I, if uh, you want to know my opinion, and I would be happy to tell you, because we have been discussing with Hawking and with Kerr, the big mystery is not the travel, the travel in, uh, in time, but the big mystery is why you have part of the matter in the universe, but there is another matter in the universe which is antimatter. And while matter goes on in time, on, antimatter goes backward in time. And one of the fantastic mysteries which maybe you can help to solve in the future is what is this uh, asymmetry between matter and antimatter and uh, time versus time versus minus time, which we discover also in the mass formula, also in this mass formula, which I have shown before, which still, even today, brings, uh, brings me back to this problem. How matter and antimatter are related to the solution of this equation. Because out of the black hole, you create matter and antimatter. And this matter and antimatter proceed 
at very high velocity and is the one which justify the gamma ray burst. Sorry, it's the wormhole, not black hole. The wormhole, the uh, it's wormhole is a sort of connection uh, between uh, uh, the two universes. No, yeah, 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 yeah. I think it's it's uh, it's more profound than that. Not profound. More profound. We are living. I mean, we are living with matter and antimatter in this universe, and they go in different times. In Shushen, we have been studying quite a lot of this, but we have not yet understood in the simplest way. When you understand something, and you, you can feel it inside, it's simple. We have not understood simply yet the matter-antimatter duality. So do you think that is uh, plausible? Yes. It's plausible? Uh, to study matter and antimatter, to reach an understanding, certainly. All right. <laughs> and here comes the last question. And I just heard that you uh, have a lunch, with, uh, have a dinner with Stephen Hawking. Yes. Only I think it's very awesome. <laughs> and, and the last one concerns a piece of news these days. It is said that Stephen Hawking urged our human beings to build spaceships immediately because the Earth won't be able to live within 200 years. You're right. Is it a rumor? No, it is true. It is true. He had prepared. I have the manuscript. I have the manuscript. If you like, I will give you the manuscript. So and I that, didn't get your point. Eh? I, I didn't get your point. I, uh, I received from Stephen Collaborator the manuscript of that proposal of Stephen last week. Yeah. I don't know if it's out yet, but his point was that we have to go by 2020 to the moon and by 2025 to Mars. And then he has a very, a very, uh, a project to send a, a, no, a small ship, microscopic, to Eta Centaurus, to uh, the closest star to see if there is a solar system. We have been discussing quite a lot of this point with Roy Kerr. We were three, Hawking, myself, and Kerr. You. And I have to tell you, I don't agree with the point of uh, uh, Hawking. I don't agree. It's too simple. So, too it, simple. You cannot take people from here and go uh, a, any place. The point is, the point is, we have eight billion or more people on the planet Earth. We have absolutely to find a way to keep our civilization going. Here, not uh, trying to say that we move to another planet. No, we have a big urgency. Urgency. The planet is finite. The energy are finite. We have to educate ourselves here, now, in universities, in understanding the life on the planet and how to make it feasible. And especially, make sure that a case of turbulence on the planet Earth will not destroy our knowledge. We have to plan our education. We need to plan the education, to plan the resources, how to use the resources, how to not pollute. This is a big problem. 
we cannot just try to go away. No, the problem is here. And I am very happy to see China. Because when I came here 40 years ago, there was a single plane going from Guangzhou to Beijing once a day. And now I see the development of uh, uh, Shanghai, of uh, 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 Chengdu. But we have to be careful. We have to plan our life on the planet. We need, uh, we have this amount of resource. Let's not hope to go away to solve going to America like in the past. In Europe, when there was a mess, they were going to Australia, they were going to America. This is not the way now. The way now is different. We have to learn not to just geographically going, no. The going to another, another place on the earth is not a solution. We have to educate, to learn, to, to learn uh, how the limitations are to develop technology which allows to live in this planet. You understand? That is the point. And to make sure, this is the key point, to make sure that the situation can be rationally developed, taking away the uh, pollution, the uh, uh, control, the, the production of CO2 and so forth, control, and make such that like you are doing, you can build a university like that with garden, with river, but you need to educate people to know the finite size of our planet and to make sure that everybody has a decent life. Everybody should have a decent life, one, and second, should be happy and conscient of what he's doing. Only if this is uh, the case, this is the case of Hawking was fantastic. I mean, he's there, he cannot speak, he cannot move, but still, still he's happy. Still he smiles, you understand? And, and that is the key point. How even in a condition like that, you can produce science, help science going, improve homo sapiens, improve culture, but be careful. Because if this is not planned, this is, if this is not planned, people will be very angry and they will kill each other. Therefore, we have to use science to progress, but also to make sure that we make a plan for this. It cannot be random. It has to be planned. And this is the thing, to me, is the most surprising thing I have seen in this recent trip in China since my first visit 40 years ago. You have been able to plan and to develop. But let's be careful, because you have to take into account that the planet has to be living and happiness, in my opinion, in my opinion, you ask my opinion, happiness does not come from music, does not come from eating. A lot of happiness can come from science. From science, because science produces endorphins and produces happiness. So it seems that you you think that educating the generations is very urgent and important, right? Extremely urgent. <laughs> Extremely urgent. All right. This is Jimmy the truth. Why, why I am happy to be here. Well, whatever I can do. Extremely urgent. And if you see somebody who is not learn, help him to learn. Help him to understand how privileged we are to live on the planet. 
but uh, we have privilege and we have also duties for everyone. Sh cannot be egoistic. It cannot be thinking about his own happiness. We have to think about the globe. We are like clothes in a in a <laughs> in the planet Earth, which is beautiful. As the sun, let's use everything. Let's not pollute. Let's educate. And especially, let's people understand what the Homo sapiens is, what Einstein did, why we are understanding how the universe works. When I was a student like you, there was no knowledge about yet neutron star. I participated. I invented the name Black Hole. We have been working in this. We have seen with passion to understand all of this. And they are byproduct. For example, you know, I showed you the satellite, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Italian satellite. That satellite had X-ray detector. And uh, yesterday, or the day before, China has been launched this marvelous X-ray satellite. And they have X-ray detector. The first man to invite the X-ray detector was Ricardo Giacconi. And one day in the airport, there was all this big problem of... Uh, uh, and then uh, <laughs> Giacconi and Gorski said, why we don't use this uh, X-ray detector which we developed for the satellite to check the luggage in the airport? We put the source, X-ray detector, you put the luggage, and uh, you can check what there is inside. Well, next time you go to the airport, don't forget, this is a byproduct of the X-ray satellite, precisely, which discovers Cygnus X1. That one. And now, <laughs> when you go in the airport, remember, this is a byproduct of astrophysics. We have to learn how to use astrophysics, how to use the discovery, not only to understand nature. For example, the example I gave you of DNA. But no biologist think about mutation. OK? But they don't understand that mutation are a byproduct of radiation of the supernova and the gamma ray burst. You understand? Therefore, this is a byproduct. In these days, we are understanding from gamma ray burst, we are understanding, where we know that iron, carbon, oxygen comes from the sun. But uh, iron and gold come from supernova. We did not know uh, until two or three years ago where uranium comes from. And uranium and the heaviest element, very like, comes from gamma ray burst. <laughs> Therefore, the heaviest element are created in the largest explosion in the universe. But we are, we, we are reaching the understanding, and we are more happy, we are more stable, there are no mysteries. Science will keep going. This was a key message we, di we discussed with uh, Hawking and with Roy Kerr. Science has never ends, because the more you go on, the farther you expand the knowledge, the more problem beautiful you find, and you, the more you understand. Yeah, I cannot agree with you more. And, and why, why did Stephen Hawking think that we should leave our Earth within 200 years? Is that the reason for climate warming or other, uh, or other reasons? Well, uh, this is all his own business. It's not my business. I have a different opinion. My opinion is we have not to run away when there is a danger. When there is a danger, you must have the courage not to run away, but to collaborate with everybody to solve the problem. Yeah, I don't think that he's, 
he, he, I know that uh, you think that we should uh, convey our uh, civilized, uh, civilization to the next general. And is that, uh, do you think that is, um, do you think that uh, we should leave our Earth within uh, hundreds of years? I, I am, I am uh, looking forward to have uh, politicians to be ready to understand these problems rationally and to help to solve them. Scientists can help, but they cannot do politics. Scientists can help, but uh, I don't think we... Uh, I have a good uh, optimism that in 200 years we will have a community which instead of uh, just uh, looking TV and so forth, but will be self-educating to participate in the broad knowledge. I, I'm fantastically impressed by this visit in China. I had, to, I had today a small bones in my throat at lunch. They, they took me to an hospital in front of the hotel and in few tens of minutes everything was ready. The, they look, they find pictures, they interview, they solve the problem. This today is possible. And much more will be possible in the future. But we have to collaborate between science, technology, society to keep going. Not to create disorder. No panic. There must be no panic. There must be rational and joy, joy. Because this is the main message I got from, <laughs> from Stephen. When I told him how beautiful is this house, this house, he said, yes, Rema, I built it myself. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Let's thank Professor Ken. Okay. okay.